As I said, this is gonna be a masterclass focus on uh, Milky Way quality and tracking. So tracking is one of the best techniques. I'm gonna explain to you everything in this webinar and check in the program. This is what we're gonna see today. So this is the main index of uh, everything that we are checking today. I'm gonna take my camera just a little bit down. One second. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, that should be fine. So this is the program for today. We're gonna start seeing um, why tracking, what's the reason for tracking. Uh, we're gonna check uh, one of the most frequent questions, uh, tracking camera gear. We're gonna talk a lot about lenses, focal lengths, and especially trackers. I know that many of you, many of you have a tracker, but some of you probably you don't have a tracker yet, and you're wondering uh, which is the best tracker for me, what are the different types of trackers in the market, and similar questions. So don't worry because we're gonna see everything about trackers today. And after that, I will show you how to do this step-by-step -step, because uh, that's one of the kill things. When you are tracking, you need to know how to do the setup. So I'm gonna show you how to do the setup depending on your tracker. Then we'll dive into the uh, camera settings because the uh, camera settings are very different when you're tracking compared to uh, normal Milky Way photography. So we'll dive into the camera settings and lead, like, well, one of the last points is gonna be pulse processing. Pulse processing again is a key and fundamental part when you're tracking. It's a bit different for the normal uh, pulse processing. So I'm gonna show you a complete uh, workflow with different examples. And lastly, I will show you a PSD with all the layers so you can see this step by step how I edit my images. Finally, uh, I will show you Capture the Milky Way, which is a very exciting project that I think is gonna help you a lot. And the last thing is gonna be the Q&A. So as I said, all your questions are gonna be for the end of the, of the program. And in the meantime, just feel free to, uh, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the presentation. All the slides, as I said, are gonna be available. So don't worry about the slides and just enjoy it. So first of all, I know that um, many of you are coming from uh, the community and know me, but in case you don't know me, my name is Don Safra. I'm a professional astrophotographer, a landscape photographer. I'm original from Spain, from Madrid. That's why uh, you can guess my accent. And I've been living in Pennsylvania, out of Philadelphia for the, last, uh, for the last three years. So I'm based now in the United States. And my passion is doing uh, landscape and astrophotography. I, I've been doing Milky Way photography for many years. And my passion is doing uh, photography. I'm sharing all this and helping others improve their photography. That's why we are here today. So um, the way I do this is uh, in two different ways. First of all, uh, through Capture the Atlas, which is my, my website. Um, this is an online platform. We are a travel and photography blog. We are probably the biggest blog in terms of uh, Milky Way photography online. We have like a lot of articles, eBooks, guides, inspiration articles, and many things. One of the things we run, for example, I'm the creator of the Milky Way Photographer of the Year. That's a very, uh, popular um, award-winning list that we compile every year that is featured by National Geographic, Forbes, The Guardian, BBC, etc. cetera. Uh, apart from that, we create the Milky Way calendars. You probably already have one. And these are downloaded every year by more than 40,000 people. So it's very nice to share this with, you know, all over the world. Also, I do instruction in the field in my photo tours. So I run a photography workshops and tours. We've been on hold during the COVID, but we are now getting back in September to Iceland. And I run photography tours in different areas in the world and also, as, and also astrophotography tours. So that's another thing that I do. And now before jumping into uh, tracking and everything that I'm going to show you today, I want to share a little bit about the story of uh, how I got started and why I started tracking. Because I think that this is gonna be uh, very important in order to explain everything that is coming up later. So um, first of all, I'm gonna explain about my first Milky Way images. And as you can see, they were pretty terrible. <laughs> I'm sure that you are uh, familiar with this. Uh, all of you have taken your first Milky Way images. And yeah, let's be honest, it's an incredible experience. You are seeing the Milky Way uh, with the naked eye. It's an amazing experience. You see your first stars capturing the camera in the LCD. And it's amazing. You'll feel like, wow, this is incredible. But being honest, once you start seeing images online and seeing uh, what you can get, you can see that your images are pretty terrible. They are having like a lot of noise, no colors, and they are just terrible, <laughs> terrible, as I said. 
So uh, when I was at this point, I said, okay, what can I do to improve my Milky Way photography? And what I did, this was like a many years ago, I decided, I just heard that I needed a full frame camera to get better quality and a wide angle fast lens. And that's what I did. I bought my first Nikon D800. I bought my, uh, my lens, the Nikon 1424 2.8, a fantastic lens. And I started shooting a Milky Way again. And then I improved, now I noticed some advancement. It was much better. I mean, the difference was like night and day, literally. It was a huge difference. All my images have now like more quality, better colors and more details. So I was pretty happy with my images and everything was fine. However, I keep learning, studying Milky Way photography and I came across with some images taken by some uh, professional astrophotographers that had like uh, more colors in the sky, um, air glow, colors um, in the Milky Way image, in the galactic core, more details, less noise. And I was wondering, how can I get those images? That's when I just started looking into start tracking. I heard about this for the first time, maybe three years ago, and I had no idea what a start tracker was. Actually, I didn't have any idea that I could take longer exposures at night, which was like, wow. So what I did, I bought my, my first start tracker, which was a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. I went to the Adirondack Mountains here in New York. I took my first image and I was just blown away. I was amazed. It was incredible. It was something that I hadn't seen before. And that's when I got into tracking. And that's what I've been doing over the last years and what I'm uh, doing right now. So when I started tracking, the first thing I noticed is that all my images have much more details, more image quality, better colors. It was just like a huge difference. So one of the main differences was the colors. So for example, like in this image, you can see the air glow, all these uh, green and beautiful colors in the sky. All that was impossible before. That was one of the main differences. Uh, I start seeing a lot of colors in the sky. Much better, okay, perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I was talking about colors, but not only colors, but also I was seeing other things. Here, for example, is another example in Death Valley National Park where I could capture uh, the Milky Way with a better proportion in the sky. Again, better colors, better quality. Same, more quality and just more impact. I mean, all my images, I was very happy with the results. And that's when I started with getting new trackers, starting new techniques, getting into longer focal lengths and experimenting a lot. So this took me to capture images that I was finally very happy with. And I tried to summarize everything in a very easy and simple workflow. And that's what I show you today, how to do start tracking from start to finish, from the capture to the post-processing. So this is the, um, you're gonna get started now. And before I get started, first of all, we have to dive into this question. So why tracking? Why we track? Well, the answer is very simple. And I'm gonna explain it to you now all the reasons why we have to track. The first reason, well, and you've probably heard this like a thousand times. I'm pretty sure that when you were starting in Milky Way photography and you check YouTube videos or online blogs, you read this. You have to keep your lens wide open. Use the, use the maximum aperture in your lens. Also, raise your ISO. If you are shooting the Milky Way, you should raise your ISO like above 3200, maybe 6400, ISO 5000, just keep a high ISO. And also limit your shutter speed. Remember that if you want to capture pinpoint stars, you have to follow the 500 rule, the MPF rule. How many times did you heard this? A lot, right? Well, that's why um, the problems with this and with all these conceptions that we have is the following. If you keep your lens wide open, you're gonna have a smaller depth of field. This translates into less details. If you are keeping your lens wide open, you're gonna see more chromatic aberrations and more aberrations in general, more coma in the corners and other problems. If you raise your ISO above 3200, you're gonna see something very important and it's the loss of dynamic range. And sometimes people think that raising the ISO is related to more noise. And which this can be partially true, the more important thing when you're raising the ISO is that you're losing dynamic range. These are the colors and the details in your images. And lastly, and most importantly, is the limit in your shutter speed. If you limit your shutter speed to 
20, 25, 30 seconds, you're gonna see a ton of detail noise and a loss of image quality. That's why uh, these are all the conceptions that we have and all this can be eliminated when we track. So uh, one of the um, examples uh, to see this, for example, is here. As you see, this image could be fine. I was pretty happy with this image when I took it in the Canadian Rockies. It was one of my favorite image at that time. And then with the time I noticed like all my stars in the corners have comma, like a terrible comma. I don't have any colors in the Milky Way Galactic core. It's everything is like kind of white. Why is the reason? I don't have any air glow in the sky. Everything looks kind of blue. Everything looks noisy in the sky. Why? That's why that's happening because you are using just the standard Milky Way settings and shooting the Milky Way from a fixed tripod. So um, the solution to this is, as I said, use a star tracker. And believe me, and you'll remember this forever. Once you track, there is no way back. I like saying this because once you try tracking, you will change your Milky Way forever. It's gonna be a revolution and it doesn't matter. You will never do normal shooting, stacking, all that is not comparable to tracking. So um, we're gonna get into this in today's as I said. And let's, uh, first of all, we're gonna start seeing what is a star tracker. Many of you probably know this, but in case you don't know what is a star tracker, it's very simple. It's just a device with a small motor that we can use to compensate the Earth rotation. As you know, we live in a planet that is spinning at a very high speed in space. And that ha what that means is that when we're shooting the Milky Way or the stars for more than 25, 30 seconds, the stars look like trails. So using the tracker, and this is very important, aligning this motor, this device with the uh, celestial pole, either the north or south celestial pole, depending on your hemisphere, you'll be able to move your camera at the same speed as the motion of the stars. So you will be able to follow with your camera the motion of the stars. That's basically a tracker. It's very, very simple. So what are the benefits of using a star tracker? Well, first of all, and this is the most important, is the increase in the shutter speed. When you use a tracker, there's going to be less noise in the images and you will be able to adjust better settings. You are no longer limited to 25, 30 seconds and now you can capture images with much better settings. For example, you can stop down your aperture you are no longer limited to the widest aperture in your lens. Now you can close one, two, three stops, and this will translate into a bigger depth of field with more details and less aberrations. Your stars are gonna be much better in all the frame. Next, you'll have the chance to lower your ISO, and this is gonna be, again, fundamental. We'll, we saw it again. ISO is related to the dynamic range, and a lower ISO is going to translate into a higher dynamic range more details, more colors, and just more quality. So are there more benefits in tracking? Yes, there are more benefits in tracking. It is inexpensive. Of course, you have to pay for a tracker, but if you compare to a lens, it's much, much cheaper. Uh, let's say, for example, a normal lens from Milky Way. The cheapest lenses are probably the Rokinons, which are around three to five, six hundred dollars. And if you want like a really good lens from Milky Way, it's gonna be anything above one thousand dollars. Any like the uh, Nikon 1424 that I said before, any Sony uh, fast lens or Canon or whatever lens, it's gonna be more expensive. A tracker is an inexpensive piece of gear. It can start anything from two hundred dollars up to four five hundred dollars for the normal models. There are of course more expensive trackers, but that's for doing deep sky and professional astrophotography. For Milky Way, we are fine with any of the basic trackers. And the other benefit is that they will transform your camera gear. Even if you are using a crop sensor camera or if you are using a, like a no, not a very good lens, you will see huge benefits now. Using a tracker, you will see like a big change in your images, even using this basic camera gear. So that's the other good thing. Even if you are using basic camera gear right now, get a tracker and your camera gear is going to transform into a super camera gear for Milky Way. Okay, so now we are getting into the tracking camera gear, one of the most important things, what we need for tracking. Here we're gonna talk about lenses and focal lengths. We're gonna talk about the different types of star trackers and other accessories that you will need when you track. 
First of all, I'm gonna talk about the um, focal length. It's one of the most important things that you have to bear in mind when you're tracking. Um, just grab this in your mind. When you are tracking, the narrower the focal length, the more difficult it's gonna be. Or put it another way, the wider you go, the easier it's gonna be. That doesn't mean that you always have to use a wide angle. We're gonna see different examples, but just bear in mind that with wide angle lenses, it's gonna be easier. For wide angles, we consider anything from 12 to 24 millimeters. And as I said, this is ideal for using uh, with, a, with a light tracker. Uh, we'll see later the different types of tracker. Just uh, to let you know now, there are different types of trackers. We have light trackers and advanced trackers and standard trackers. So when you're using a light tracker, these uh, wide angle uh, focal lengths are gonna be ideal. The problems of using, of using a wide angle are that you'll find more aberrations, so basically more comma, more astigmatism, uh, more deformations, and also less detail. You are capture a narrower field of view of the Milky Way, and that's gonna translate into less detail. Second thing are the medium focal lengths. Uh, with the medium focal lengths, you will see a better image quality and more details. Uh, medium focal lengths are anything between 24 and 50 millimeters, and the good thing is that you will capture more details and a better perspective of the Milky Way. The other benefit is that there will be less deformations, so everything in your Milky Way images is gonna look better. And the cons of using a medium focal length is that they require at least a standard tracker. There are some light trackers that you can use uh, with a medium focal length, but you have to consider a few things. Uh, normally, we'll use this focal length with a standard tracker. And also, they are more complex, so they are a bit more complex to, to take images with this. Um, you will have to do a, more, a better pore alignment, that is something that we'll dive, uh, dive later into. Um, better pore alignment, better uh, settings, and have a bit more experience. Lastly, we have the uh, short telephoto lenses, anything like 85 millimeters, 135. And this is something just to do, uh, this is like another almost genre because we are getting into more deep sky astrophotography. And here you can capture, of course, more and more details, but it's gonna be much more complex and you'll need more camera gear, like counterweights, uh, more accessories, uh, L brackets and more things. So we're not getting into this today, but just bear in mind that if you have like a standard tracker, this is something that you can do as well. Then uh, in the types of uh, star trackers that we're getting now, we're gonna see light trackers and standard trackers. We're gonna see right now all the differences between the two types and hopefully you are thinking about getting a tracker. This will help you uh, decide which tracker is best for you. So getting into the light trackers, uh, the benefits of a light tracker is that they are cheaper. So if you compare with other trackers, these are very inexpensive. Uh, they usually start around uh, $200, like the Mooship Move is the, this one here, uh, anything about three to $400. Uh, they are also lighter and more compact, so they are perfect when you are traveling. They are very convenient. Uh, some models, like the Mushu Move, as I said, it basically, as you can see here, it fits in the palm of the hand. It's a very light, very portable, and very convenient when you are hiking, traveling, etc. And the other thing is that they are very easy to use. So these trackers are very simple, very straightforward, and if you're starting out, they are very good to, to start. Uh, the problems with the trackers is the, first of all, the load capacity. These models usually have a load capacity of six pounds, of around three kilos. So with these six pounds, uh, this is as what the manufacturers say, but honestly, I wouldn't put anything more than five pounds in, the, in these trackers. And that means that, for example, if you have like a very heavy DSLR or a very heavy lens, I wouldn't use these trackers because uh, these trackers have like a very small motor and this is gonna cause a lot of stress, a lot of stress to the motor, and that's gonna translate into worse tracking. That's why when you're using a light tracker, bear in mind that there's a low capacity. Also, there are limits in the focal length and the exposure limit. So for example, if you're using a wide angle, it's gonna be fine, but if you jump into 35, and especially 50 millimeters, with these trackers, it's gonna be much more difficult. They're gonna be limited. And also for the shutter speed. With these trackers, one, two minutes, it's fine. Anything about three minutes can kind of start to be a bit more complex. So you have to be careful with that. They're also more unstable. So you are shooting under windy conditions and that's one of the worst things when you're tracking, shooting with the wind. You're shooting with uh, windy conditions. These trackers are gonna be more unstable and it's gonna be more difficult. 
And lastly, the battery life. In these trackers, the battery life is usually five, six hours compared to other trackers. So getting now into the standard trackers here, the biggest benefits is uh, the, one of the biggest benefits is the low capacity. With these trackers, you can load anything above maybe 10, 11 pounds, something like that. That's usually the limit, 10, 11 pounds, which is around five, six kilos. And that means that you can set up a DSLR, you can set up bigger gear and more things. So that's one of the benefits of using these trackers. The biggest benefit to me is that you can use a longer focal length and a longer exposure. So for example, with these trackers, you can shoot with 35 millimeters, 50 millimeters for three, four minutes with no problem. And that's very difficult with a light tracker. They're also more stable. So for example, if you are shooting under windy conditions, if it's not extremely windy, when there's too much wind, you cannot track. But if there's like a light wind and some difficult conditions, this tracker usually can do fine. And, use, and lastly is the longer battery life. These trackers, you can have battery life for 20 hours and even more. So that's one more thing. The cons of these trackers is that they're a bit pricier, so not very much, but if you compare to light trackers, they are a little bit more expensive. They actually range anything between uh, $350 to $450. So it's usually like a, if you're planning to get a tracker like this, uh, just plan that it's gonna be like $100 more compared to a light tracker, just on average. Uh, the other cons, and this is one of the main cons for many people, is that they are bigger and bulkier. So if you compare to light trackers, these trackers, like the Skywatcher, for example, are gonna be heavier and bulkier. So they take up more space in your camera gear, and when you're hiking, this can be a problem. And lastly, the last cons is that they are a bit more complex to use. There are some things like the setup that are gonna be a bit more complex, but with a little bit of practice, it's not that difficult. Don't worry, because later I'm gonna show you how is the setup with these trackers, and we will see everything. So now at this point, you might be wondering uh, which tracker should I get? This is one of the most common questions. Well, so here's my list of recommendations. And if you feel identified with these statements, this might be a good tracker for you. So if you have light camera gear, like a mirrorless camera, if you want like a straightforward setup, you don't want to get very complex with a difficult pro alignment and you just want to do something simple. If you take long trips or very long hikes, especially if you are hiking in the mountains and things like this, I'd recommend a light tracker. If you are shooting with a wide angle, and, and that's fine for you, you don't really need to go to a longer focal length, a wide angle is fine for you, then this is a good option. And lastly, if you don't plan to take advanced track panoramas and mosaics. Uh, track panoramas and mosaics is probably the most difficult thing to do when you're tracking. If you're using a light tracker, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. You can do them, but it's gonna be much more difficult. So for this, I recommend a standard tracker. Now, um, when should you get a standard tracker? Of course, if you have any mirrorless camera, it's perfectly fine. But if you have a heavier camera gear, like a DSLR, I recommend having one of these type of trackers. Also, if you take short trips and short hikes, anything like maybe two, three miles, or like a short trip, these trackers are fine. Um, if you are looking for the highest quality in your images, this is the most important thing. If you want to have the maximum quality, I would highly recommend to get one of these. Also, if you want to take a bounce at track panoramas and mosaics, as I said, these trackers are gonna make everything easier. And lastly, if you would like to try deep sky astrophotography. Deep, deep sky is something very interesting. I, I, I like it, I've uh, doubled in it. I'm not an expert by any means, but uh, it's something very interesting. And if in the future you would like to try it, you can use one of these trackers. So um, which trackers should I get? We're gonna talk a bit, uh, just a tiny bit about models. So in the, there are many more models uh, of trackers. There are like a ton of uh, tracker models. I'm gonna talk about the trackers that either I have or I know a bit better and I tried. So in the light trackers, my recommendation is always uh, the motion move to me is my favorite, because as I said, it's very light, very portable, and very convenient. Um, the second light tracker that you can take is the Skywatcher Mini. Uh, this is a very good light tracker, but there are two main issues. The first is that there is a scope, so the, pro and the setup is gonna be a bit more complex. And then the other thing is that, and this is the thing I don't like at all, is that you need a mobile with a Wi-Fi connection. This tracker has no buttons. So you have to use a mobile with a Wi-Fi connection to operate your tracker. I don't like that because if you're in the field and you run out of battery or whatever problem you have, you won't be able to track. 
Another thing is the Ioptron Sky Tracker. That's another option. It's also light tracker, very easy to set up. But there are some things like, for example, this uh, EQ, the equatorial wedge, that I will show you later what it is. But this equatorial wedge, and there are more things that to me doesn't make sense if you're using a light tracker. To me, a light tracker must be portable, convenient, and easy to use. And to me, all this is done by the motion move rotator. And if you're using a standard trackers, of course, there are more models like this, like the Bix and Polari, Fornax, there are many more. But I'm gonna explain to you that two, uh, these are probably the two most popular trackers in the market and the two I have, and I know a bit better. So um, these are the Skywatcher, Star Adventurer, and the Ioptron Sky Guider Pro. In terms of functions, are basically the same. They have the same payload capacity. The way you operate the trackers is basically the same thing. So it's, they're very similar. But there are some things uh, which differentiate the trackers and some things that I like and I don't like in each tracker. Talking about the Skywatcher, for example, I've been using this for the longer time. I love this tracker. The Equatorial Wedge is very comfortable, very convenient. Two things I don't like. The most biggest cons, the biggest cons that I think this tracker has is that there is no uh, on and off button. So basically there is like a wheel on the side. The wheel is here. And this wheel is basically when you switch the wheel, you start your tracker. The problem is that this wheel is very easy to move. So sometimes it can happen that your tracker is in your camera bag, you are getting to the location, and then you see that your tracker is on. This happened to me in the Adirondack Mountains like two years ago, and it was a pain. I got to the Adirondack Mountains, I was hiking, and then when I was about to start tracking, I noticed that my tracker was on and the batteries were almost off. So that's something I hate and I don't like about the Sky Watcher. The other thing is that the scope to do the pro alignment is something that we'll see later as well. It's not illuminated. As you see here in the picture, if you see this uh, little piece of plastic, that's the scope illuminator. So whenever you want to see through the uh, reticle and the illuminator, you will have to touch this piece of plastic. And it's a very cheap piece of plastic that you're gonna lose and you're gonna break. Mine is actually broken. So, so yeah, this is uh, the worst thing about the Skywatcher. Uh, the cool thing is that it's a very reliable tracker and it's very good. Uh, talking about the Optron, it's a very good tracker. I love a couple of things. There's an on and off button. You can charge with an USB very easily. And the other thing is that the scope illuminator is internal. So you don't have to attach any other illuminator. You just, just turn your clutch and you're, you'll see everything illuminated inside. So that's a very, uh, very convenient thing when you are tracking. And believe me, once you have more experience, you will see that that's a very convenient feature. Uh, the other thing I don't like about the Ioptron, and this is a real pain as well, is the equatorial wedge. Is this piece here. And as you see, it's very small compared to the Skywatcher. Um, I have very small hands, and when I'm operating this tracker, sometimes it's difficult to tweak the adjustment with your fingers. So that's why um, I don't really like the, the Ioptron equatorial wedge. Apart from that, it's a very good tracker. So now at this point, uh, my final recommendation is that you should use the tracker that best suits your photography style and your goals. Every person is different. We have different camera gear. We do different types of photography. Some people prefer to travel. Some people prefer to travel uh, more locally. Um, you have some goals. Maybe you want to take the best possible images. Maybe you are fine with some uh, basic track images. So it depends on your goals and your photography. Um, I'm gonna show you my, my experience. As I said, I have uh, three trackers. I have the Mooship Move, the Skywatcher, and the Ioptron. Um, depending on the situation, I use one tracker or another. If, for example, I'm hiking in the mountains, taking a long trip, or just want to walk very easy, I use the Mooship Move. If, for example, I want to do like a very specific um, track panorama with a um, you know, with a longer focal length, if I want to make sure that I'm getting the maximum quality in my images, then I use either the Skywatcher or the Ioptron. Here, for, and sometimes, for example, I can use both. Like in this image on the right side, you can see this was in Bryce Canyon National Park. It's a viewpoint. It's like a one minute from the, from the parking lot. And what I did is I took my two trackers. So on the right side, I have the motion move with my Sony 20 millimeters wide angle. And I was taking just a single image of the Milky Way. If you look on the left side, I have my Skywatcher with the uh, Sony 35 millimeters and I was doing a track panorama because that way I can capture more details and more quality. And I was using both at the same time. 
Um, also, I have, I have readjusted with time. I tend to use more lately the ioptron because it's a bit lighter and a bit more compact. It's something I didn't mention before, but this is also very important as well. Uh, the ioptron is a bit lighter and a bit comp more compact than the Skywatcher. So sometimes I like using the ioptron, and what I do is using the Skywatcher Equatorial Wedge, as you can see here. And as you see, um, the thing is that you should use the tracker, as I said, that best suits your needs. Now we're gonna dive into the setup of the tracker. Uh, well, first of all, I want to show you uh, some images here. Let me grab some water. I can see that you are um, writing in the chat. Don't worry because like, we will see all the questions that you have at the end of the, of the presentation. Yeah, so just so you, so you can have like a good reference, this is the Skywatcher Star Adventurer Pro. This is the Milky Way. And as you can see, um, there's like a ton of detail, ton of the uh, colors. And what I used with this was a 20 millimeter lens for the sky. It was a panorama shot with a wide angle. But the cool thing is that I could capture all the colors, all the details, because I was taking a long exposure. I think it was like four to five minutes uh, for, this, uh, for this image. Maybe with a lighter tracker, I wouldn't have been able to expose for such a long time. Another example, this is an Alstrom Point, <clears throat> sorry, Alstrom Point in Utah. And this is a trap panorama. This is a more complex image. It's a trap panorama taken out uh, with 35 millimeters with the Ioptron Sky Guider Pro. Again, uh, I think that this will be very, very difficult to do with a light tracker, almost impossible. And that's why I use this tracker. Now we have the motion move and uh, this image, for example, was taken very simple, vertical image with a 20 millimeter lens. And then horizontally, I tracked the Milky Way, as I said, with a 20 millimeter lens using the motion move. So it was a very basic uh, setup. So this is what you can get with the different trackers. Now getting into the setup, and um, this is gonna be very important, so pay attention to all the steps. Uh, we're gonna see um, how's the process using the different trackers. But there are some processes that are the same. So for example, the first step, and this is one of the most important steps in the whole process, is to level your tripod. It doesn't matter if you are using a light tracker or a standard tracker, you have to level your tripod. If you don't level your tripod, your first image is gonna be fine, your second image is gonna be fine, but then after five minutes, you'll see that all your images and all the stars look like trails. So make sure that you level your tripod. <clears throat> second, we have to mount either the ball head or the equatorial wedge. If you're using a light tracker, like the motion move, it's very simple. Just put your ball head on top of the tripod, like you do normally. If you're using a standard tracker, like the Skywatcher, the Yachtron, any other standard tracker, you have to use the Equatorial Wedge, also called Altitude Azimuth Base. There are two different names for this. So this is very simple. This is to align your tracker with the Celestial Pole and to do micro adjustments when you do the pole alignment. Don't worry, this sounds a bit difficult, but you will see everything now. So basically, these have two different uh, screws. The one on the top, this is the uh, latitude, uh, latitude screw. And using this with the latitude base, you can adjust the latitude in your wedge. So for example, if I'm in Pennsylvania, uh, 40 degrees uh, latitude north, or north latitude, I can set up uh, like a 40 here. There are different markations with numbers. I just set up the number 40 and my tracker will be ready for that latitude. Then there are different uh, screws here. And those are the azimuth screws that you can see are at the back of the wedge. And using these screws, we can readjust our, um, our tracker and do the pro alignment. So we can move the wedge and do micro adjustments. This is important if you are using, as I said, a standard tracker, especially with a longer focal length. The third step, well, one thing here that I would recommend also is that for tripods, that because this is one of the most frequent questions I get, for tripods, I recommend that if you are using a standard tra uh, tracker, get a tripod with a base that is the same uh, base as your, as your uh, wedge because that way it's gonna be completely stable. If you're using a, track, a tripod with a narrower and smaller um, um, base, then your tracker is gonna be overlapping and when there's windy conditions, it's gonna be more difficult. The third step, you have to slide the tracker over the ball head or the equatorial wedge. 
So basically, as you see on the left, we have the motion move just slide the tracker. If you have the Skywatcher or the Iopteron, is doing the same thing. This is a very easy process. Fourth step, mount a ball head or a VC bracket on the tracker. Um, here there are two different options. So the first option, and you can use this in any tracker. It doesn't matter if it's a light tracker or a standard tracker. You can use a ball head or a VC bracket in your trackers. On the left side, for example, you can see the motion move with the second ball head. On the right side, you can see the Skywatcher with the Z bracket. So here, there are different options. You can set up the Z bracket in the motion move or the ball head in the Skywatcher. It doesn't matter. It, there are different ways of doing this. The main difference for this, uh, my recommendation is for simple tracking, for single images, you can use a ball head with no problem. If you're using um, maybe like a longer focal length, if you want to take track panoramas, then you should use a Z or V bracket. I'm gonna make life easier because uh, when you are tracking and you are tracking panoramas, for example, your camera is gonna be moving and also your ball head. And when you have to readjust the movement, it's gonna be very, very difficult. Especially if you are taking uh, big panoramas, like I will show you later, this is gonna be very complex. So, um, the next step, once this is ready, we have to attach your camera and ready to shoot. And this is very important and I'll talk a, a lot about this. So as you can see on the leg, we have the motion move with all the setup, ball head, tracker, ball head, and the camera. And on the right side is the same thing, sky watcher, Z bracket, camera. And as you notice, uh, the intervalometer is in the camera. And this is for one reason. When you are putting your camera in your tracker, it should be full equipped with everything that you need. So if you need, like in this case, an intervalometer, if you need like a lens heater, if you need a power bank, whatever you need attached to your camera right now before doing the polar alignment. Because otherwise it's gonna be very easy to throw off the polar alignment and that's the most important thing. So make sure that when you are loading your camera on top of your tracker, your camera is ready with everything that you need. Fifth step, and this is the cr most critical, most important, and the most important thing that you have to do, polar alignment. It's basically aligning your tracker with either the north or the south celestial pole. The way to do this depends on your tracker model. So there are different ways to do this. Some trackers allow for a simple way to do it. Others are a bit more complex. But for example, if you're using some of the light trackers like the motion move, the process is very simple. You can use a laser, and using a laser, you can just align your tracker. First of all, if you are in the Northern Hemisphere, you're a bit luckier because uh, you can use Polaris, which is in the uh, is very easy to recognize in the night sky. So Polaris is very easy to see and you'll be able to align very easily. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, South America, South Africa, whatever, don't worry because uh, you can still do it fine. There's no problem, but it's gonna be a bit more complex. Uh, you can still use the Southern Cross and the pointers and stars to identify where is the um, Sigma Octantis uh, or, or the Octans. That's the area for the uh, for locate the South Celestial Pole. But it's very important to know where these are uh, where are these located to pro align. Uh, doing the pro alignment process is probably the most complex things. And we could have spent like an entire master class talking about polar alignment. So I cannot get into this into uh, in depth. I'm gonna show you just basically how you can do it, but just bear in mind that this process can take a bit longer. It's not difficult. It just requires a bit of knowledge on, and practice. So with the motion move, for example, or all the light trackers, like the Iotron Sky Tracker, you can just point with your laser to the sky and that will be fine. If you are using the Sky Watcher or the Ioptron, you can, uh, you'll have to use an app. There are different ways to do this. The classical way is uh, the clock. It's uh, like this clock that you can see here. This is what you see when you pierce through the, through the tracker. So when you pierce through the scope, you will see a clock like this. This is the clock in the Ioptron. And what you have to do is use an app to see where is Polaris, because Polaris is the, it's in the North Pole, but Polaris is moving very slightly, but it's also moving. So you have to locate using an app where is Polaris, and then using your tracker, do find adjustments, like you can see here with the azimuth screws, to move the star to the right position. Sounds a bit complex, but believe me, it's not really difficult. Six, you have to turn on the tracker, adjust those settings, and shoot. So here, um, this is another recommendation. Um, you should turn on your tracker, make sure that you are selecting the right uh, hemisphere, either northern or southern hemisphere, because they are different, and adjust those settings and shoot. 
I highly recommend to adjust the settings if possible, even before pro align the pro alignment, because uh, we're going to talk about uh, a little about this uh, later. But um, it's very important that at this point, after doing the pro alignment, you don't move your tripod and your tracker. Everything must be stable because our tracker is aligned, and we don't want to produce any misalignment. So once we take the image, last step, and don't forget it is truly, truly critical, is to check that you capture pinpoint stars. So as you can see here, this is an example, like when you take your images, you take your shots, you have to open your LCD screen, zoom in, and make sure that all your stars are sharp, like points. If they are not sharp, there's something wrong, and you have to repeat part of the process. Of course, you don't have to load the tracker again or do anything. Just make sure that your tripod is level, do readjust the pro alignment, and take another test shot, and then check again. But make sure always that you're capturing pinpoint stars. And that's basically the process for pro alignment. And as I said, there's no time for diving deeper into this because it will take like uh, two hours. But what I'm going to give to you is a, bit, a few tips and recommendations that you can use when you are doing the pro alignment. So some pro alignment tips. Um, the first of all is that you need to learn to find polaris and the octans. Of course, these are the um, the references for uh, finding the celestial pole. So you need to know very well how to find polaris and the octans. Second, uh, as I was saying before, mount and prepare all your camera gear before the polar alignment. And I'm talking uh, after my experience, because this happened to me like a lot of times, you do your pro alignment, you spend a lot of time refining, everything is fine, and then you mount your camera gear, you take a test shot, and your stars look like trails. Then I peer through the scope and I notice that the star is moving from the scope. That's because, or oh, in the motion move, your alignment is wrong. That's because when you load all your camera into the tracker, your pro alignment can be thrown off. So you have to be very careful with that and make sure that you are mounting everything before. Also use a laser. Uh, you can use a laser and this is going to be uh, very convenient. First of all, use a laser if it's allowed in your country. I know that there are some countries like Australia, Switzerland, and other countries where lasers are banned. So in those uh, countries, you cannot use a laser. But if you can use a laser, like here in the United States, uh, be careful also with the cities and areas where you're using a laser. But if you can use a laser and it's uh, fine to do it, it's gonna be very convenient because uh, one of the main issues when you are doing a pro alignment, you will piece through the scope and there are two options. Option A, you won't see any star, everything is gonna be blank. Option B, which is the most common, you will see a lot of stars and they'll look the same. And this happens always. I mean, when you're looking at the stars with the naked eye, they look fine, they look perfect. I mean, you can see Polaris and it's like a bright star in the sky. The problem is that when you're peeing through the scope, all the stars have the same luminosity. It's very difficult to know which is Polaris. So using a laser, you can just use a laser, any cheap laser that you can get in Amazon for 10 bucks. Using a laser, you can just point at Polaris and identify which is the right star. Also, check your pro alignment during the session. And this is another thing. If you are taking, let's say that you set up your gear, everything is fine, but you take your first image and everything looks perfect. You have pinpoint stars, you're excited, and come on, let's shoot. After maybe five, 10 minutes, or even like, worst of all, after the end of the night, you check your images, you keep shooting, and they look like trails. That happens because you didn't check your pro alignment. As I said, it's uh, sometimes happens and it's common. It's not very rare. You are gonna be tracking, everything is fine, and then maybe after 10 shots, your stars look like trails again. You have to readjust the alignment. Um, during the pro alignment, um, as I said, requires a bit of practice, I will say later, but basically uh, check during the session your pro alignment to check that everything is fine because otherwise you can find bad surprises. Um, another thing you have to, uh, very convenient, use an app when you can see Polaris or the Octans. This is one of the questions that I receive uh, most often. So for example, um, if you are shooting from a cave, or from an area with mountains where you cannot see Polaris or the Octans. Or if you are close to the equator and you cannot see uh, Polaris because it's very close to the horizon. In those cases, you can use an app. There are many different apps in the market where you can do like a rough polar alignment that is gonna, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be uh, able to shoot for maybe four minutes with a longer focal length, but maybe with a wide angle and a couple of minutes, it's gonna be fine. And last but not least, 
be patient and practice. I can say this always like a thousand times when I'm teaching people tracking. Be patient because at first it's gonna be a bit complex, it's gonna be a bit frustrating, it's normal. First time is gonna be uh, very frustrating, probably second time, but then it will work. And the most important thing is to practice. And the good thing about this is that you can practice whatever you like. You just need to check where is the sky and do the pro alignment and shoot. You don't really need the Milky Way. That way, when you're in the field, it will be much easier. So practice, practice as much as you can. Now talking about another very important thing are the track camera settings. Here we could spend another masterclass just talking about this because they can get very complex as well because uh, there are many factors depending uh, for the settings. First of all, bear in mind that the camera settings for track images are gonna be completely different compared to shooting a Milky Way from a fixed tripod. That's the first thing. Uh, so, um, and the you know, there are many factors affecting the camera settings. Like for example, your camera gear, your camera sensor, your lenses, um, the light pollution in your area, the air glow, the uh, focal length that you're using, as I said, um, the wind. There are many factors that would uh, have an influence in the settings that you need to use. So I wanted to give you just like a very, very general reference. Just bear in mind that this is very general. Using a wide angle and a full frame camera, which is something that the most common uh, usually um, for the settings. In terms of the aperture, you should close one, two stops from the maximum aperture in your lens. This doesn't mean that it's mandatory, but it's recommended. If you close your aperture, one, two stops, you're gonna see much better uh, quality, uh, more depth of field, as we said before, and just better images. For the ISO, I would recommend to find the sweet spot between the noise and the dynamic range. ISO is a very complex topic, and most people think that the higher the ISO, the more noise in the image. And while this is partially true, it's not entirely real. Um, sometimes a higher ISO means less noise. If you never heard this before, it must be shocking, but this is true. When you're tracking and you're tracking like a long exposure, it doesn't mean that you need to take ISO 100, ISO 200, because that's gonna make more noise in the image. Once you raise the exposure, it's going to create more noise. So usually the cameras have like a sweet spot where you have like a good amount of noise that is very low, and at the same time a high dynamic range. Because uh, the higher the ISO, and this is 100% true in all camera sensors, the higher the ISO, the less dynamic range you will find in your images. Remember, dynamic range is colors, is details, and is quality. So usually you have to find a sweet spot. It's very difficult to say one setting for everything. It depends. Usually, and I'm talking about my experience, my ISO usually ranges between 640, and this is the minimum I use, up to 3200. I never raise the ISO above that unless there is something critical. Um, talking now about the exposure, and this is of course the most important thing, exposure anytime from one to four minutes, but depending on conditions. Uh, again, it depends on your focal length and it depends on your tracker. Uh, one, tip of, uh, one piece of advice here is that don't overexpose your images. And this is something that can happen at first. You start tracking, you manage to edit everything fine, you are capturing long exposures of the Milky Way, but then you realize that your images, uh, when you get home and you open your image, they are overexposed because you're exposed for five, six minutes. Be careful because if you overexpose your images, you're gonna blown out all the details and it's gonna be worse. So uh, to me, a good reference point is using the histogram. Histogram in track camera settings to be usually in the left of the mid-tones. So you take the histogram, always go to the left of the mid-tones and it should be around there. You need a lot of experience and a lot of practice to know which are the best settings in each situation. Once you are comfortable and you have more experience, you can get to a location and you automatically you of course have to take a test shot, always take a test shot, but it will be very quick to adjust the settings. As I said, this can take like an entire masterclass, we don't have time, but I wanted to let you know just a few uh, recommendations. Okay, post processing. And again, this is one of the most critical things when you are tracking. Um, first of all, and I'm going to say this very slowly because you need to keep it in mind. It's key, it's fundamental to start with well-captured images. It's critical. If you don't have 
a good image to start with, a good raw file, it's gonna be impossible to extract all the potential of your images. So always make sure that you are using the right settings to capture your dream, a fine setup, first of all, a good setup with your tracker, everything is fine, everything is aligned. And secondly, you're using the right settings and all the stars are like pinpoint, there are colors in the image, there's nothing blown out and everything is fine. That's the best starting point. Secondly, use a good white balance. Here I want to um, talk about another misconception that there is in the uh, Milky Way uh, photography community that is that you should use a cool white balance. I've heard that like a thousand times. You should use a white balance like 3300, 3500, like a cool uh, white balance. And I heard that and I did it in the past. And the problem with that is that all your image is going to be blue and it won't represent the colors in the night sky. Now, first of all, I want to make here one note and is that photography can be taken as an artistic choice. And if you're looking for something artistic and you want your Milky Way to be blue, it's perfectly fine. It's your artistic choice. But if you want to get the real color, the real natural colors in the night sky, you should use another white balance. Usually the best reference is a daylight white balance, which can be shocking, but it's actually the best way to start your white balance to get more natural colors in post-processing. Uh, I usually set my white balance in automatic with my Sony. I had the Sony A7R4 and the automatic white balance works perfectly at night. It says like a daylight white balance. And when I'm doing track panoramas or something like that, I set a manual white balance and it's around 4,000, something like that, which is a bit warmer than usual. But that will allow you to capture and extract better all the colors in your night sky. I know that you can change this in post processing, of course, but it's a, one of the best ways to have like a good starting point when you are doing the post processing. Start your editing with a good white balance. Then we get to the most critical part, and it's the blending. You have to, of course, when you are tracking, your sky is gonna be perfectly sharp, but your foreground is gonna be blurry. Think that your camera is moving for one, two, three, four minutes, whatever and your foreground is gonna be blurry. So you have to take one shot for the sky and another shot for the foreground. Your picture for the foreground is gonna be blurry and then you have to make a blending to blend those two together. Uh, doing a blending is not difficult, it's not, uh, I mean, it can be difficult in some situations, as I will show you later, but a normal blending is not difficult uh, and it's gonna be fundamental if you want to have like both uh, images captured with the sharpest adjustments. So um, I will show you later how it can be uh, the blendings, but be very careful with the horizon. This is very important. When you are tracking and there's something cutting the horizon and overlapping the horizon, think that this object is gonna be moving for two, three, four minutes, and it's gonna be wider than your sky shot than the, for, this, for the foreground. So when you try to merge, there's gonna be some misalignment. I'm gonna show you this with one example, but bear in mind that when there is something in the horizon, it's gonna be difficult one piece of advice again, and if you are not a purist, because you can consider this a composite, is if you are tracking, for example, and there's a tree, just move your tripod a couple of feet to shoot with no, with no trees. Um, that way you don't have any problem in the blending because when you're blending with trees, with branches, it's gonna be a real pain and very difficult. Sometimes it's even impossible to do the blending, especially when there are many branches and you expose for a long time. So bear in mind that you have to be careful with the horizon. Also, and this is a critical, is to apply the right techniques to extract the full potential of the data that you're capturing, of your images. You need to know what techniques you have to apply, when you have to apply them, and especially, uh, those are the two keys. So what you should do and when you should do it. I know that many people, when they are uh, doing the post-processing, it's just tweaking adjustments and see what happens. Let's uh, increase the contrast, let's increase the saturation, let's uh, reduce the stars, but they don't really know the process and the steps when you have to do them. It's critical to follow an order and a series of steps to know uh, how to post-process your images in the best way. Now I want to show you a different real-life examples of uh, post-processing, so we're gonna jump into the first, and this are the before and after. Okay, so <clears throat> getting into the before and after. Uh, this is the first example, Delicate Arch in Utah. You have seen this picture like a thousand times. 
And here on the left, we have my image for the foreground, 100 seconds, F2, ISO 800. On the right side, I have my image for the sky, uh, 128 seconds, F2.5, ISO 64, uh, 640, sorry. Um, these are the settings that you see for tracking. I'm tracking for a couple of minutes. I'm closing my aperture a couple of stops because the aperture was 1.8 in my lens. It was a Sony 20 millimeters. And ISO was me minimum ISO I used, 640. So these are my two images. First, I do the shot for the sky because my goal was to capture the galactic core inside the arch. And secondly, we have this image for the foreground, which was like a few minutes later. Well, the first thing I do in post-processing is I take the image for the foreground and I raise the exposure. This was taken, as you see, with very good settings, 100 seconds, F2, ISO 800. My camera is ISO invariant, which means that I can raise the exposure and there will be no noise. As you see, we are increasing the exposure and this looks fine. Next step, I have to do the blending. I have to blend my foreground with my sky. So we do the blending and this is the result. This is what I mentioned before. As you see, the track image is wider than the image for the foreground. Think about it. In this image for the foreground, here is like a one minute exposure from a fixed tripod. Here, my camera is moving for three minutes and this arch is gonna be wider. So we have to fix this. Is it possible to do it? Well, yes, you can do it, but you have to bear in mind a few things. And also the process, you know, follow the right steps to do it. Once you do it, you can find, fix this. As I said, if you are doing this with branches or trees, this is gonna be more complex. And then once you have this ready, this is the initial blending. Now we have to blend both images to look more natural. Because as you can see here in this area, this looks like very uh, low contrasty with wrong colors and it looks very off. So we have to make both images look the same. So that's what I do with this process. I follow different adjustments and I make everything look more natural. As you can see here, everything looks like the same image. I fix this area and all the colors are more in tune. Once I have my image ready, I can do my normal post-processing with all my steps. And this will be my final image with all the adjustments. And as you see, I have all the colors, all the details, all the um, natural colors in the night sky and everything looks fine. Now we're gonna see a second example, which is a bit more complex, but let's check it out. It's a um, track panorama with, uh, well, it's actually a multi-row because there are different rows, multi-row track panorama with a blue hour blend. There are many things. This is probably the most uh, difficult scenario that you will find when you are tracking, but I want to show you everything so you can see that it's possible. So this was taken in Astron Point, it's the picture I showed you before. And first of all, I started taking my images for the foreground during the blue hour. This is something that I do when I have the chance to get back to the location. I usually go in the blue hour because that way I can get more details and more less noise. And later I just focus on tracking and getting my track images at night. So here after sunset, I track my images. There were 13 images at, uh, well, first of all, this was taken with uh, 35 millimeters. So it's a relatively long focal length. So 13 images at 125 second of a second, F9, ISO 320. So very good settings. Now my sky images, there were in total different rows for 28 images, 60 seconds, F1.6, ISO 800. So as you see, very good settings. I wish I could use like a narrower aperture and probably like a bit longer exposure, but it was a bit windy and I prefer to keep the exposure in the safe side. So as you see, there were 28 images at 60 seconds. It took me like 30 minutes to take all this. And during that time, you had to be very focused, making sure, checking that all the images are fine. Because uh, if, for example, all the images are fine, but this one image in the middle with trails, because I moved my tripod, because there was like a wind gust. In that case, I have to repeat the image. So when you're doing panoramas like this, always check your images. Then I do the stitching in PDG Pro. I highly recommend this software for doing the stitching. I, first of all, I do my foreground, which is uh, very easy, nothing difficult here. And then I do the uh, stitching for my sky. Here you can get a bit more complex sometimes, uh, especially in this situation. You can see everything fine here, but when I did the first merge, since I was using a wide aperture, there was a bit of vignetting and there were some kind of uh, seams here. So I had to fix them, but you can do it uh, using PDG Pro. There are different adjustments to fix the, the seams. 
So now my panorama looks perfect for the sky. Also make sure that you capture more on the sides. And later what I do before getting into Photoshop, and this is critical, I drew my star reduction. I know that some people like doing this in uh, Photoshop, but it creates a lot of artifacts and I prefer to do it outside Photoshop in a professional astrophotography software. Uh, so what I do, and this is one of my favorite steps because you can start seeing all the details of the colors in the night sky. So look at the difference. This is my normal sky and this is my image with no stars. As you see, we start seeing more details in all the sky, but of course we have to fix this. So now I'm going to show you the next steps in our real PSD file. So you can check, let me just one second. I'm going to show you the different layers and the process that I follow to create this, the final shot. So I'm going to open Photoshop. I know that you're writing in the chat. Don't worry because we'll check everything after the end. So you can just take note of your questions and then we'll just see everything. Yeah, I'm opening Photoshop right now. Just one second. And this is gonna be very interesting to see all the different steps. All right, so I'm gonna bring up to exit here. Bring Photoshop. We're gonna adjust this. Okay. And this is my final image. It's the image from Alstrom Point. So I'm gonna turn off all the layers and show you the entire process. Um, yeah, we turn everything off. Yeah, we are getting to the end. And yeah, this is the base layer. As you see, this is the uh, PDG Pro adjustment. Okay. And I'm gonna merge this with my sky, which is here. And what I do previously, this is my sky from PDW. Well, not from PDW. Uh, this, that's what I want to mention is that the first thing I do before I jump in here, I do a merge between my normal star shot and my image with the star reduction. You have to do a process because in the star reduction, there will be no stars at all. And you have to recover some stars. There are different processes to do this. And that's a key. You, doing a star reduction is easy. The key thing is to know how to integrate both images and when should you do it. So this is my sky, as I said, and this is my foreground. First thing I do is fix the foreground. As you see, I'm fixing this. Later, I have to do a mask. And this is critical again, when you're doing a blending, you have to do a good mask. So I'm gonna mask everything here with the horizon. Here there are different techniques, but it's something that uh, you have to do. So I merge here my sky. My sky is merged now. And now I have to fix the blending because as you see, if we zoom in, you can see here that there's like a kind of bluish tone here in this area. And this happens like a thousand times. I've seen this online many times and it's the most common mistake in post processing. Be very careful with the blendings. Blendings sometimes are difficult, but you have to do it in the right way. So what I do with this adjustment is fix this. As you see, this is kind of bluey, low contrast and doing this adjustment I'm just eliminating that in the horizon. After this, I did a transformation because this is a bit unbalanced. So I do a transformation just a little bit to straighten the horizon. And this will be my base layer. So up to here is uh, what I call uh, destructive and image formation. And now we'll start with the normal post processing where I usually follow the same steps. So first of all, I start applying like a bit of contrast. See, a bit of contrast there. And now I start working different adjustments and these are fundamental to extract all the details, different adjustments to extract details in the Milky Way. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see them better. So as you see here, for example, this is the Milky Way core. And with this adjustment, I extract all the details and all the information in the Milky Way. Here I do a second structure adjustment. It's not really noticeable, but it's there. It's just like a tiny bit to extract even more detail. I fine tune with another extractor adjustment just to make sure that everything is as smooth. And once this is ready, my extractor is done in the sky. I do the uh, as bands, uh, bands dodge and burn. This of course takes some time because there are different adjustments in each group, but I do the dodge and burn and that way I get more volume in the Milky Way. As you see it with the before and after. 
I'm getting much more volume in the whole Milky Way arch. Once I finish with my dodge and burn, and this is an there are many ways to do a dodge and burn. I do like an advanced mode to do it that is gonna uh, create like a better shot. And after this, I start working in the colors, and this is my favorite part. Doing some adjustment, you can bring out all the colors, and your image will look uh, naturally um, very well. So, for example, if I go here and here again, there are different adjustments that we have to do. I click here and I'm not painting the colors and making up the colors. This is just using the colors that are in the image. I'm just boosting them. And as you see, all the colors in the galactic core, in the Antares region, in the air glow here, as you see with the greeny tones, are coming alive. So if I zoom out, you can see the difference there. I apply like a, another color adjustments. Okay, and all this is natural colors. As you see, I go step by step and slowly. That's another recommendation. Always go slowly and don't rush. Now I do the dodge and bend for the foreground. So the base for my sky is done already. And for doing the dodge, dodge and bend for the foreground, I create some luminosity masking. And as you see, I create more volume and more light in all the foreground. So here, um, as you see, uh, I know also blending the light pollution, which was coming from the right side. That way your images will look more natural. So I was blending that. And once this is ready, I have my base layer two, what I call, which is my base post-processing, my all my basic uh, post-processing. Now I get into all the details. So for this, the first of all, is a series of adjustments to work in the glow and color of the stars more specifically. So I create this and I you see, some stars like here in Antares and some of the regions in the Milky Way are coming alive, right? Now I do the H alpha simulation. You probably, I don't know if you know about this, but um, this has to do with the uh, colors that your camera can capture. If you, um, all the cameras have like a limit in the sensor and there are some colors, specifically the red uh, H alpha colors that are in some areas in the Milky Way and the night sky, those colors are gonna be very faint in your images. To capture these colors, you have to astro modify your camera. You have to remove the clip sensor. You have to take it to a note, maybe one store to do it. Um, and but there are some cons with this. Um, then you have to know more about post processing because it's going to be a bit more complex. And also, um, there are some things in your camera that can go wrong. So I prefer to not astro modify my camera right now. And what I do is I create a series of adjustments to enhance these colors in the night sky. So as you can see here. If you notice here in the Antares region and Sea of Yuki, this star, you will see that they are coming alive and also a bit of the colors in the Milky Way. Yeah, so next uh, adjustment, I do a vignetting. So I vignette a little bit just to um, lead the viewer's eye to the Milky Way. I, and I love this step, it's one of my favorites. I create a series of adjustments to extract all the details in the air glow because the air glow, apart from color, they ha it has details. So using this, as you see, I'm enhancing all these bands of air glow. And I do like a second adjustment for the air glow. And that way I'm bringing also all the air glow to life. Then I will get into what I call my final adjustment. And first final adjustment, what I do is fix errors in the image. So for example, if I notice here that there's like a brownish uh, dark uh, side, I don't know the reason, here there is like a trail. So what I do is doing a layer to fix this. So as you see, especially this area, I'm fixing all this, right? Then I'm doing another final adjustment layer to increase more detail, more contrast, more colors. And then at this point, I leave my image marinating for maybe one, two days, even more, um, even longer. And then after that, what I do is get back to the image and decide if I need to readjust something. So that will be my final adjustment, which is here, as you see, this is my final adjustment and this is my final image. So as you see, doing this technique, we can capture all the details, all the colors in the night sky and everything looks perfect. It's, uh, it can be, this post-processing is a bit longer, of course, because we are doing many different steps, but as you can see, you can perfectly do it. 
So if you have any questions about this, now at the end of the uh, pre presentation, you can just ask any questions. I'm going to get back to the presentation again. Yeah. Yeah, so right now, um, going forward, yeah, now I want to talk about something. Uh -uh. Let me make this big. Now I want to talk about something very, very special. Um, something that, as I was saying during the week, is going to transform your Milky Way photography. Uh, it's a project I've been working on for a long, long time. Almost, I've been, it's been in the making for two years. And I've been working the last eight months just full time on this project. It's something that if you are part of the community, you probably know what I'm talking about because I've been discussing this a lot in the emails. And uh, I'm happy to announce that it's finally ready. So it's, um, it's an online program to help you improve your Milky Way photography. And I just want to show you the details just in case you want to join because I'm sure that this is going to be a game changer and it's going to be something that is going to transform your Milky Way photography and help you with everything. It's called, um, sorry, it's called Capture the Milky Way. This is the program. And it's taking a lot of work to put this together. So I hope that you like it. So just briefly, I'm going to show you what's inside and what's included. Um, first of all, there is a ton of instruction. I've made sure that this is the most complete online Milky Way course that you can find on the internet. So there is basically everything that you can find from the basics to the most advanced techniques that we're seeing, like tracking, post-processing, and everything. So in the total program, there are more than 60 video tutorials and lessons, and more than 23 hours of video tutorials. So this is divided in three different modules, so you can follow them step by step. In, you know, it is regarding your skills. It doesn't matter your current skills. There will be something to start. So uh, these are the three different modules. And I'm going to show you very quickly uh, what's included in the different modules so you can know uh, what's inside. So the basic module, for example, there are 21 lessons and more than eight hours. Here we get into the basics and all the foundation on Milky Way photography. We talk about planning, how to plan images. This is super important. It doesn't matter if you track or if you don't know how to shoot, you need to know planning. Here I explain my complete workflow in four steps using Google Earth Pro, photo pills. There are different uh, things I'm gonna show you and this is a very complete planning, uh, planning uh, module. We will also talk about the camera gear, which are the best cameras, best lenses and everything. Camera settings, which settings you should consider for capturing your Milky Way images. Composition, this is a complete masterclass in Milky Way composition, more than 50 minutes talking about different types of uh, compositions and how to improve them. And basic post-processing, even if you don't know how to use Photoshop, I will show you step-by-step step how to get it started checking and editing your first Milky Way images. Then we'll jump into the advanced module, which is, uh, of course, a bit more advanced, and it's going to be over six hours. And here we'll dive into uh, more advanced techniques like stacking, which is a great technique if you don't want to track, or if it's, for example, windy one day and you can track, you can do stacking. Uh, panoramas, how to capture any type of Milky Way panorama. Blendings, this is the thing we're discussing. You need to know how to blend images. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are tracking or not, blending is fundamental, and especially if you are tracking. So here I explain, like in five, six different video tutorials, different scenarios with different images, how to do the blendings, how to do the selection, the masking, how to refine the mask, and how to do blendings perfectly. We'll also dive into star reduction techniques with some of the basic techniques to do the star reduction in Photoshop, and also into advanced post-processing. Here we'll talk about all the structure, colors, and all this. Finally, we'll get into the pro tracking module. And this is the most advanced module. And it's more than seven hours and 19 lessons. And here we'll discuss everything about the star trackers. So what we see today is like a sneak peek because there we'll discuss everything more in depth. So I will show you um, the different buttons in the trackers, how you can set up, which accessories you need, um, and more things so you can make your information to decide which tracker is best. So it's everything about start trackers. I will show you the complete setup. So how to use the tracker step by step. So what, what we see today, but with more in depth. So it will be everything explained step by step from the poor alignment to, you know, setting your tracker from the recommendations, from everything. Then the poor alignment, as I said, this is a complete, uh, this requires like a complete class for this because poor alignment 
it's like a series of different steps. So I show you how to do the pro alignment with light trackers, with advanced trackers, and with uh, the gear that you're using. Trap panoramas and mosaics. This is something also fundamental, and there is not much information online about how to do this. It took me like a long time to know how to do this because there's like a lot of trial and error. And I show you how to do the most advanced techniques and most advanced images, like trap panoramas, like the one I show you from Astron Point, and also mosaics to get more resolution. We also talk about tracking camera settings. So it's almost like an hour video talking about the different camera settings that you have to use depending on your tracker, depending on your camera model, depending on all the situations that you can find. When there is wind, when there is light pollution, everything will explain there. How to read the histogram, how to do the test shots, everything is there. And lastly, pro post-processing. This is also uh, very complete and you will find how to do a stitching of a multi-role track panoramas. Um, you also find uh, time and focal length blends, which is also very useful when you are tracking, how to merge different focal length blends. Um, pro as month star reduction, because um, as, as I said, when you're doing the star reduction in Photoshop, sometimes you will see artifacts. So to do the most professional star reduction, you have to do this out of Photoshop and doing different steps. So I'm gonna show you that also in this module. Uh, H-alpha channel simulation, even if you don't have an Astro modified camera, you'll be able to get all the red colors in your, in your nebula. And lastly, the extraction of natural color and air glow in your images. This is also critical to extract all the details and all the colors in the air glow. So all this includes uh, a complete guide and setup. So for three different trackers. So the three trackers that I have and I, I know very well, the Move Shoot Move, the Skywatcher and the Iotron have a specific module just for the trackers where you will see everything since you buy the tracker, how to open the package, how to install everything. Like you, see, you can see here, you have to install different things, how to uh, use the buttons, how to use the tracker, how to do the pro alignment, things that you have to consider when you are tracking with this type of uh, start trackers and everything about these three trackers. So it's uh, one complete uh, module about the motion move, one complete about this Skywatcher, where again, I show you everything about this tracker, how to level, especially with this tracker, how to level your unit, how to do using the L bracket and any other things. And also with the Ioptron, same thing. I'll show you step-by-step step how to use the Ioptron. This also include uh, six complete start to finish video tutorials just for post-processing, where we will see literally everything. Single salts, stacking, twilight blends, track shots, track panoramas, focal blanks, everything. So from the basic to the most advanced, everything is gonna be there. One start to finish, for example, are the two uh, images that we saw today, the delicate arch that we saw with the masking, and the second, the Astron point, the last one we saw before, that's gonna be also included. It's a complete video tutorial, like 90 minutes of uh, material where you will learn how to do it step by step all the post-processing. Apart from these, uh, are included more than 80 raw files and PSDs, so you can start practicing even from today. So that way you can start practicing and download the raw files and you don't really need like a tracker. You can start practicing now and follow all the video tutorials. There is also a limited support included. So every module has like a different area for comments. Also, you can drop me an email. There's an area for send me an email and there will be a group. That way you'll have unlimited support and this is not for one, two months, it's forever. So whenever you have any questions or need any help, you can get in touch with me, we can arrange a call, we can you know, talk by email, by comments, whatever you feel more comfortable with, and I will help you out with your photography. Also, access to a private community. We have created a group to where we can share, and this is gonna be just private, just for the community. It's gonna be uh, photo reviews uh, about the different images that we're taking, that way we can improve our images. Uh, questions, you can propose new tutorials. I'll let you know when there are new updates in the course and everything will be in this private community. And also apart from this, there will be unlimited access. This is not like a monthly subscription or anything like that. There's like a single payment and you'll have access forever. Uh, you can see this from any device. So there's like an online platform that uh, you don't need to download the videos and take like a lot of gigabytes in your, in your hard drives. Everything will be online and you can watch it from the iPad, from your iPhone, from wherever you like. And also everything is recorded in 4K. So there are 4K video tutorials. Also as a bonus, there will be free updates. So there are free updates forever where I will upload new, new videos related to new techniques, uh, new start to finish tutorials. 
So uh, you, for example, um, I'm planning actually uh, maybe for next month, I will upload like even like a new uh, start to finish tutorial. And I will keep uploading new start to finish with new images. Also new role files so you can pr keep practicing and there will be new updates coming up and they're all free. Another update is a photo to discount. If you would like to travel with us in the future, maybe to an astrophotography tour in the field, there will be a discount. So the amount that you are paying for the course, it will be a discount equivalent for any of our photo tours. So all this is included, all this package, everything is included in the same package. There are different packages. Everything is just one single package with a lifetime access, as I said, and everything is included. Now you might be wondering, what's the price for this? So let's dive into the price. And the price for the complete program with everything included, free updates and everything, it's $299. However, we are now in the launching of the, of the product, is the launching week. So now for one week, there's gonna be a special 20% discount. This is ending uh, next week, next Sunday. And during this uh, time, the final price is gonna be $239. So this is the final price. And as I said, all this is included. And most importantly, this is just years and years of experience of shooting the Milky Way, of trial and error in the field, summarized in a package that is very easy to follow and that will get you results. I'm 100% that this is gonna get you results. So this is basically everything. I'm gonna leave, um, I'm leaving the, uh, in the chat the link in case you want to check it out or everything is there included. Also, um, Important to mention, well, this is the link. You want to check it out. It's uh, academy.capturetheatlas.com. So going to this, uh, to this link, you can check it out. If you go to the slides, you can click in the link and it will take you directly to the website. And also, um, if you are watching this as a replay in YouTube, you can check the link in the YouTube comments or in the YouTube description. That way you can just click and go to the course and see all the details. Um, Last but not least, I'm uh, well. I'm 100% sure that this is gonna be uh, critical and it's gonna make a game changer in your Milky Way photography. Then I'm offering a 15-day money-back guarantee, and there is no small print. If you get a course, if you start and you think that it's not the right course for you, or you don't like it, just simply let me know and I will find and I will give a refund in the first 15 days. No questions or anything, because I'm 100% sure that this is gonna be critical and it's gonna be very helpful for you. So now before jumping into the q and I want to show you just very quickly how's the online platform so you can have an idea. Uh, it's gonna be very quickly as I said, and I'm going, and when you go to the courses, well, first of all, you have to go to your account. Yeah, and here you have all the courses. So you go to courses or you click here, you'll see the different modules. So here you can see the basic module, the advanced module, and the pro tracking module. If you go, for example, to the pro tracking, we click here, and you will see here is your uh, process with the different modules, and here below are all the lessons. You will see introduction, tracking camera gear, polar alignment, as you see, there are more than six videos for the polar alignment, tracking setups, tracking settings, everything is here. So if you, for example, want to check uh, track panoramas, you can just click, and it'll take you here. And on the left side, there's a menu that you can hide or put inside. And here you can navigate, go to the lesson that you prefer. Everything is ordered in a logical order. Uh, it's set up in a logical order. So here is the video. You can just play and you will start playing. You don't have to do anything else. I'm gonna turn down the volume. And here we'll start seeing everything. So if you go, I will explain to you, for example, here, how to take trip track panoramas following all the steps, step by step with uh, examples, with everything. Here below, you can see uh, the text, links. Sometimes there are links in case uh, you need something. And here you can leave your comments whenever you need help and I'll help you out. Also as for the, um, for example, you're going to post-processing like Astron Point, this is the start to finish image for this. Is the one I showed you before. This is a post-processing video and the same thing, well, you can maximize this to occupy the entire screen. And here you'll see the start to finish of this process. So everything is covered from PTW, the stitching, the star reduction, how to do all the steps, everything is there. And of course, here is the explanation. 
And finally, you'll have the chance to download the raw files if you want to capture and do the picture step by step, following all the steps, and the final PSD. That's also very helpful in case you want to follow it. And that's going to be very convenient. Once this is completed, you can mark complete and navigate through the different lessons. So it's, uh, as I said, it's pretty straightforward to navigate, to use. And like I said, it's going to be, I think, that very, very helpful in your Milky Way photography. So I'm going to take this out and start now with the Q&A. And, and you're going to start now writing your questions. We are in the Q&A. So if you have any questions regarding tracking, tracking models, anything about what we saw today in the masterclass, anything about the course, whatever questions you have about this uh, online program, just feel free to leave it in the chat and I'll be super happy to help. Uh, yeah, DC Dan is asking if uh, 239 for all three courses or for each course. No, everything is included. So you will get everything. All this is included with the same price. So it's 239 for the three different modules or three different courses, and it includes everything. It is like a single package and everything is included. Yeah, one second. Uh, I think that the camera is not working. Yeah, any other questions here? Yeah, just one second because I think there's a problem with the camera. Yeah, I think the camera is back. Yeah, sorry about the camera, he was back. <laughs> I am, um, yeah. Um, Yeah, uh, Doug is asking a very interesting question. It's about a star reflection when tracking. That's a very interesting question because right now I believe that, I don't know if it's possible, I would say that it's almost impossible to do it because if you are tracking, it's a change in the direction. So what you're doing or what I do when I'm tracking, like in some images, I take my track show for the sky and what I do is a stacking for the reflection. So for example, I take 15, 20 images for the sky at a high ISO and then I blend them together. Usually in the reflection, you won't get all the details like in night sky. So it's not really necessary to track the reflection. Just make sure that you are stacking different images and that will do get more details. One second, sorry. Yeah, more questions here. Yeah, Catherine is asking if uh, the ISO and aperture aperture settings are the same? Yes, in crop sensor cameras. Yes, the aperture and ISO and all the settings are very, very similar if you're using a crop sensor camera. Just bear in mind that there's something, especially the focal length and the conditions that you will find, that will make a huge difference in the final camera settings. Um, yeah, more questions here. Um, Yeah, Rick is asking a very interesting question, Rick. It's about the laser, how to use a laser. Well, when you're in the field and you got a laser, and of course, remember, it must, to be, it must be legal to use a laser. If you're with someone, it's very easy. Like when I'm with Asen, for example, I tell her to hold the laser and point to Polaris. And I just go to my tracker, either with, uh, with the Skywatcher, and I start printing through the scope and just checking this. So I'm gonna make this bigger. I just start peeking through the scope and she's with a laser pointing at the star and I fine tune the adjustment using the azimuth knobs. Now, um, if I'm alone in the field, what I do is I take the tracker, I put my tracker, this is my tripod, I put my tracker, what I do is with the right hand, I hold the laser in the tripod and with my left eye, I look through the scope. So I look through the scope, holding my laser in the tripod, just point, and that way I do the, I find where is the Polaris. If you are using the motion move, it's very simple. You have the motion move and there is a laser that you can attach to the side. So basically you take the laser, you take this here, and once your laser is attached, you can just turn on the laser. This will be on the bolt head and 
fine tune where is polar is. So as I said, it's much easier than using the standard trackers, but bear in mind all the cones that you have when you're using a light tracker. Okay, uh, more questions here. Okay, Linda's asking about the star reduction. The star reduction is a technique that you apply to reduce the size of the stars. This is something that all professional astrophotographers do, even NASA. When you see these images from the Hubble telescope and these incredible, beautiful images of space, all of them have a star reduction because otherwise your camera sensor, especially with telescopes, is capturing a lot of stars and a lot of things. So in those cases, what we have to do is do this process, which is reducing the size of the stars, and that way you'll get more details and you'll have like a feeling of less noise. So there are different ways to do this in pulse processing. And believe me, it's one of the biggest changes when you start doing star reduction, your Milky Way images will change drastically. Um, Nels? Yeah, Nels is asking one of the most interesting questions in the webinar, and it's what's your thought in prime lenses versus zoom? Well, 100%, my recommendation is going for a prime lens. The main reason is because prime lenses, apart from being cheaper and lighter, that's one of the main things, is that um, using a prime lens, the aperture is usually, uh, prime lenses are usually faster. A prime lens usually like uh, 1.8, 1.4, like very big apertures. So that way when you close down one, two stops, it will be maybe 2.8, something like that. And that's gonna be very, very convenient to close down like two stops. If uh, the other thing is the weight. So when you are tracking, you want to cause the less stress possible to the motor in the tracker. That's why when you are, um, <clears throat> when you're using a prime lens, prime lenses are lighter and they will cause less stress to the motor. So they are usually better for tracking. So my recommendation is you can track with uh, prime lenses. Uh, you can use a uh, zoom lens, there is no problem. What I do is always in my case using uh, prime lenses. So I have a 20, a 35, a 50. Uh, and I use mainly those three lenses to track. I don't track anything below 20 millimeters because it looks very wide angle and very small, but for 20, 35 and 50 are my three favorite focal lengths. Yeah, more questions. Alex is asking if I need only the pro course. Yeah, everything is included in the same package, as I said. So um, if you go to the course, it will be everything included, um, obviously, it includes everything, the support, the updates, and everything is going to be included. As I said, the pro tracking course is like, only the pro tracking course I think is worth the money because it's like a ton of work. It's been eight months working full time and a long time tracking just to put this together. So the pro tracking course is super complete and it will be also updated with more tutorials, more post processing, but yeah, everything is included in the same, in the same package. Um, more questions? Yeah, Charles is asking if you need PTW Pro to follow the tutorials. Well, there are, um, I will say, I will recommend what you need to follow the tutorials. Uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, for sure. If you're using any other editor, raw editor, like for example, Capture One, Luminar, you can also follow the tutorials because uh, we use Lightroom just for basic uh, file preparation because uh, most of the post-processing will be done in Photoshop. So you need Photoshop for sure. Um, if you don't need how to use Photoshop, don't worry, it's explained in the basic module, in the advanced module, everything is explained. And then in Photoshop, uh, apart from this, there will be some software, like for example, PDG Pro, that I recommend for taking panoramas. If you don't want to use PDG Pro, you can use a Photoshop or Lightroom. I also show how to do this in Lightroom, but I highly recommend PDG Pro. So if you want to take capture, uh, trap panoramas or just normal panoramas, PDG Pro is recommended. The other piece of software I recommend is the Noise AI. It's not mandatory, but it's the best noise reduction software and it will be very useful. But don't worry because there is a specific module about how to use PDW Pro with all the functions, a specific module on how to use the Noise AI. So whenever I show a piece of software, there's a video explaining how to use it with everything. Interface, settings, recommendations, everything is there. Yeah, Ivanel is asking if, if it's in Spanish. Yeah, the course is also in Spanish, so you can check it out. It's, um, it's the same link, just with the slash and the ES. So it's the same thing. Yeah, Grubeck is asking if I'm getting steps, detailed steps of your post-processing in the Pro module. Yeah, 
So basically everything is explained in the post-processing, literally everything. Any single step is explained. And most importantly, the reason why I drew the step and why I do it, because sometimes there are some tutorials where you see how the photographer is doing the steps, but they don't explain why, and you don't really know the steps. Then when you're getting with your images, you feel lost and you don't know where to go. What I do with my, uh, with my workflow, and it's a workflow I've been developing for a long time, it's to follow like a series of steps and understand why I'm doing the steps in each, uh, in each step of the process. So it will be very easy to follow, very easy to, um, to keep up with them. And I explain basically everything. Whatever I do in post-processing, whatever I know, there are no secrets, is there. Yeah, Ben is asking if the course include uh, how to use Lightroom and Photoshop. Yes, in the basic course, <clears throat> sorry, in the basic course, there's a module in how to get started using Lightroom and Photoshop. So from the start, everything, even the interface, how to do the adjustments, what are the different layers. So that way you won't feel lost. And that's the good thing. Everything is uh, follows like a chronological order. And that way you can follow everything and there will be no problem. So yeah, even if you're starting out, there is one way and yeah, you can do it perfectly. Yeah, Bill is saying that he prefers his own learning steps. Yeah, and that's something I recommend. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that you have to take my complete workflow and follow the same steps in your own workflow. What you can do is just learn what I do and then whatever you feel that you like and whatever you feel that is uh, getting better in your, that you can apply in your images, uh, you can apply them. I mean, that's the best way to learn. And I understand that you have to follow 100% the same steps. What I'm saying is that I'm just showing 100% my steps, what I do, and I'm 100% sure that this is gonna be helpful for you as well, because there are many things that you can implement in your own workflow. Yeah, they're asking me, you can take uh, panoramas with the motion move. And yes, you can take panoramas with the motion move. It's gonna be a bit more difficult in some situations, especially if you are jumping into longer focal lengths. So anything like uh, 20 millimeters, 24 is gonna be fine probably. If you jump into 35, 50 millimeters, it's gonna be more complex. So that's why for panoramas, I usually prefer like a standard tracker. And to me, that's the best option. Yeah, um, Saunders is asking if you can shoot the Milky Way when there is a full moon. Well, it's almost impossible. If there is a full moon in the sky, on top of the sky, it's almost impossible because uh, it's like shooting from a city, from the, from, you know, from the lights from the city, from a place with a ton of light pollution. It's gonna be super difficult and super complex and you won't see any data, any details. Um, what I recommend is to go to a dark side or just shooting during full moon, make sure that the moon is low in the sky. For this, you can use our Milky Way calendars because that's very useful to know when it's like a new moon or when it's um, the best days of the year. But yeah, make sure that you are shooting with the uh, right moon in the sky. Yeah, Donald is asking if I go into the Ioptron tracker with the laptop, yeah, because the iOptron has like a function that you can use with a laptop to fine tune your pro alignment. I don't do this, I have the iOptron, I know how to use this tracker very well, but I don't get into that. Because um, to me, it doesn't, according to my style of photography, I like traveling a lot, hiking and doing different things. And if I have to carry like a laptop to the field, that's gonna take, I don't know, a lot of weight, a lot of space, and it's gonna make the process different. I won't feel, I think, less connected, so to speak. So I don't take any laptop and that's not included. But every, anything else about the IOTRON Sky Guider is explained and it's included in, the, uh, in that module. Yeah, Charles is asking if I cover light pollution removal. Yeah, there are some things and some tips to remove the light pollution. And most importantly, if you enhance the colors in the rest of the night sky, especially air glow and other areas, then the light pollution won't be as noticeable. You know, the viewer side is going directly to the beautiful natural colors of the night sky. In any case, there are different ways to reduce the light pollution. That's possible. And yeah, of course, everything like that is, is also there. Yeah, I don't know if you have any other questions. 
Yeah, that's one of the biggest uh, recommendations. Um, when you're shooting the Milky Way, try to go to a dark sky uh, because that makes a big difference. Um, of course, sometimes there, there's no chance. Where I live here in Pennsylvania, it's full of light pollution, except for Cherry Springs in the north, but everything around Philadelphia is full of light pollution. And you usually have to travel a lot, maybe to the Adirondacks, four or five hours to get the uh, like a beautiful dark sky. So yeah, that's critical. Try to go to a dark location. Yeah, they're asking if in the course is covered how to do multi-road track panoramas. Yeah, that's it. that's included everything from start to finish, from the setup, the gear that you need, what I recommend for the gear, how to start doing the track panoramas, and everything that has to do with track panoramas is included in that lesson. So there's like a full lesson where you'll find how to do track panoramas with no problem. Yeah, I don't know if you have any other questions. Yeah, if you can go to Namibia, that must be incredible. I have never been to a Namibia, but that must be an incredible place for, for Milky Way photography. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, I think uh, we are wrapping up. So, um, and yeah, in, if you have any questions or whatever, as I said, uh, feel free to drop me an email. Any questions about the course, any questions about the webinar. If you are watching this uh, webinar as a replay on YouTube and you have any questions, uh, probably you missed the Q&A, but don't worry, drop me an email and I'll be happy to help. Whatever you need, um, I'll be there. And of course, if you want to join the uh, Capture the Milky Way, this is the link, academy.capturetheatlas.com. Uh, as I said, I'm 100% sure that this is gonna help you out a lot in your photography. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. I hope you like this uh, masterclass, this presentation, and I will send uh, the replay tomorrow probably so you can check it out. And also all the slides so you can have all this presentation and in case you need them. So again, thank you, thank you very much for being there today. Thank you for your support. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in Capture the Milky Way. <laughs>